the devices to Luke 24. We're going to be in Luke as we go through this Easter worship. He, Jesus has risen, and he has risen indeed, you're supposed to say. Let's do that again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. This is Easter. What a glorious, glorious day as we celebrate our Lord. And what a way to celebrate as Sadie and, and Elijah and David have um, all come to new life in Christ. What a blessing. What a blessing to celebrate a new life physically with um, baby Adeline, who's being banished to the baby room where it's soundproof and she can scream her lungs out and we don't care. But we don't care if she screams in here either. Help yourself. Either drink the way is fine. But this new life comes from a resurrection rescue. It's a resurrection rescue that we are celebrating. And from what does this resurrection rescue save us? What does it save us from? The first thing this resurrection rescue saves us from is death. From death into life, eternal life, we are saved. The minute you accept Christ, and obviously there are young people that have professed and been baptized, death has what? Lost its sting. Death has no victory. It is an amazing, amazing rescue. The story in Luke of the ladies going to the tomb, we're going to pick up in, in verse in chapter 24 and read the um, first 12 verses there. So Luke 24, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, that means sunrise, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things, to the eleven, and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed the, an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking, and he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. So notice the first people out to the tomb were the ladies. You always tell us you're tough, and indeed you are. Look at that. First one's out right at sunrise, and they were bringing things they had already prepared. They were bringing spices to put on the body and to anoint the body uh, that they thought they were going to see. And what's the first thing they saw? What's the very first thing in the Scripture that they saw? The stone was rolled away. I mean, think about this. If you're going to go to work on the body of Jesus and that big stone's there, and let's say there's three or four women, how are you going to move that big stone? I mean, I'd be thinking about that. But they went, and that stone was already rolled away. And they went inside. And the second thing they saw, there was no body. No body of Christ. It's because he has risen. And they were perplexed. And I love that word in Greek. It's perplexed, but also just at a total loss. They were just, what is going on? And their mouths, I'm sure, drooped open. They bent forward. They fell to the ground when those dazzling angels came before them. They were totally perplexed. 
in that first century, two witnesses were required for most um, for most uh, court hearings, and so two men were there. But it's funny, the apostles didn't believe like four or five women. They said, we don't believe you. Well, that's more than two witnesses. You better believe them. That's the law. And uh, But two witnesses were there, uh, these two angels, and they said, you know, why are you here? He's, you know, he's risen. And this um, Greek word, I won't go all Greek on you, but it's in a very interesting verb tense. It's in the past. He has risen with ongoing actions. And he is risen, and it means literally from death, you have risen to life. It's a very rare verb, and you not only, only use a couple of times in the New Testament. He is risen. He has rescued you from death to life. And that is the first thing this resurrection rescue does. It rescues us from death to life. And then he not too subtly said, don't you remember what Jesus told you? He said, I'm going to be given over to sinful men. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I'm going to rise. And then they said, oh, yeah. And they remembered. Because a lot of things, as you know, the disciples didn't remember. A lot of things Jesus teaches us in his word and through the Holy Spirit, we don't remember sometimes. And they remembered. And they ran back, the two Marys, Joanna, and some other women. They ran back. The disciples, even though there's four or five of them probably, didn't believe them. But Peter ran, ran to the tomb. And he found the things there exactly as the women had told. For Peter, this is a moment of reflection, of decision, and of faith. He went home marveling, marveling at what happened. So he's got to think about this. And we, got to, and we know his answer. He's going to have faith, and he's going to be the rock that Jesus said he's going to be. And now he's going to turn into the rock through the power of the Holy Spirit real soon. The resurrection, Jesus himself teaches us. This is why I came. He teaches us in, in Luke 19.10 that I have come to seek and save the lost. There's a great Old Testament passage that ties in. All of God's scripture just says everything the same. And in Ezekiel 34, 15, and 16, I myself will be the shepherd of the sheep. I will be the shepherd of the sheep, and I myself will make them lie down. And I will, declares the Lord, I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strays and bind up the injured and strengthen the weak says the Lord. Jesus is the Lord, and he says the same thing. All of God's word speaks truth, and all of it authenticates itself. It proves itself. I'll never forget one of the closest experiences to a deathbed conversion in my life. Her name was Janie. That's her real name. She's been gone many, many years. Janie suffered from cervical cancer, called me up one night. I never knew her. She uh, had come back from a mission trip. I think there was a little blurb in the paper. And she just called me up. It was like 10 o'clock. Never heard of her. Doesn't know who she is. And actually, it was her husband. She couldn't talk. And said, um, my wife is dying. She's at home, and she needs help. And I guess that was back in the day before you got shot, you know, when you went to people's houses um, unannounced. And seriously, I mean, think about this. 10 o'clock at night, I think it was on a Friday or Saturday, I drove to this house. I mean, kind of run down, went in, said hello, and, and saw this lady who clearly was dying. And they told me the history. I said, you need to be in the hospital where we can give you some, something to help you with your suffering. Said, fine. So we called the ambulance, put her in the hospital. Janie was suffering with severe pain. This was metastatic cancer. It was all over. It was just eating her literally alive. 
Back in those days, all we had was uh, IV morphine. So put her on the IV morphine drip, even cranked it up as about as high as we could go. She was still agonizing in pain. I don't know if she's going to even make it through the night. Janie, I came by on rounds and came, sat at her bedside and said, good morning the next day. And she looked at me and said, Doc, what, what's it going to be like when I die? And um, I'm, I'm good with that. Are you, are you okay answering that question? What are you going to, what are you going to say? It's going to be okay. With, I said, listen, Janie, I can tell you what it's going to be like as a Christian. And let me just tell you what it's going to be like. I've been through this with many, many patients. I've been through this. Here's what it is. Jesus saves us. He's rescued us from death. And I've had patients who have seen visions or lights, and they've gone peacefully into the heaven of Jesus. And their suffering is over. Yeah, you are suffering now, dear. You are suffering now. But when you have Jesus as your Lord, it's peaceful. and You go right to be with him. She started to tear up and she said, I want this Lord. I want Jesus as my Savior. We couldn't baptize, obviously, laying in bed. She couldn't even get out of bed in such pain. I talked with her a little more. She did profess Jesus as her Lord. And I prayed with her and she was saved. And I thought she was going to be dead by noon. And I'm, you're, I'm talking about deathbed confession. Well, guess what? Her pain got better. Uh, weaned down the morphine drip, actually stopped it. She was sitting up, eating, talking, sharing with all her family that came in and telling them what Jesus said. I'm saved, and I know I'm dying, but she, she was happy. She was joyful. And two days later, she peacefully died. I mean, that's... That's what Jesus does. He, this, he's, this resurrection rescues you from death. And suffering even, I mean, that was miraculous. I mean, I'm telling you, miraculous. To have all that pain go away and to have two good days. And thank you, Jesus. How many of her family members heard that word and heard that testimony and came to Christ? Never know. But that is what Jesus does. You know, nowadays, people don't even know they're lost. Do you know that? Or half the people in this country are postmodern. They make up their own rules. They, they, their own God. They make up everything so that they're, 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 they're cool. There was a, a great cartoon I saw, a political cartoon, about there was a recent study that of significant drop in patriotism and religion in our country, okay? Particularly, um, uh, I won't go into the demographics, but a big drop. And this cartoon showed that on, on the paper, but then had a guy, you know, shaving in the mirror, and he had three of his pronouns around the mirror, me, myself, and I, okay? And that's it. There, it's you make up your faith, you make up your religion because you are God. But guess what? That's what we are too sometimes. Adam and Eve, what was their first, what was their first sin? Me, myself, and I. I want to be like God. I want to know good from evil. Me, myself, and I. How about when you're wandering? When you're not following the path God has laid out in your life, say, oh, I'm, I've got an idea. I'm going to do this. this I think it suits me better. Well, that same sin of pride, of selfishness, is what we have from Adam. That is our nature. And that is what he saves us from, our lostness, because we think, we have the best answer, but no. We are prideful. We are sinful. There is none who is righteous, not one, in Psalm 14, 3. The resurrection rescue gives us life abundantly, joy-filled 
while we're here on this earth, and then in eternally, we're in the presence of our Creator God in heaven. But there's something else this rescue gives us. This resurrection rescue forgives our sins. Now, how does that happen? Luke 15, you can flip over a couple of pages in your Bible or on your device. Luke 15, 3 through 7. <clears throat> Uh, he told him a parable, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one who's lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The lost sheep, one sinner. Notice this, the sinner, the sheep comes from the group and they're the righteous people. So these are believers, one, and he's strayed. And the, the shepherd finds him. I love that, putting him on his shoulders, carrying him home instead of yelling at him for getting lost or going down the wrong path in his life puts him on his shoulders, brings him back to the rest of the flock, and there is great rejoicing. Why are they rejoicing? Because this one sinner, the 99 that are righteous, they're doing fine right now, right now, keyword. The one who has strayed has been restored, and there is rejoicing in heaven. There's a verse that still I struggle to understand, I cannot and will not understand it until I see the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.21, <clears throat> and this is why this rescue happens. This resurrection rescue happens for this reason. For our sake, God made him, as Jesus made him, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that, for the purpose of so that, in him we might become the righteousness of of God, so that we might, and, and I won't go into the Greek on this, but so that is followed by a thing, verb tense called subjunctive, which means you may or you might, so that we might become the righteousness. And that is if we follow Jesus, if we claim him as Lord, he will make us righteous. But what righteousness are we getting? We are getting that we might become the righteousness of God. I will never, ever on this earth understand this. What, there is a word I, we call it called the golden exchange. All of my sin, all of my filth that I have, and there's a lot, as you'll hear in a minute, is taken and Jesus gives me the righteousness of God, me. I'll never understand that. How can that happen? The golden exchange. I get God's righteousness, and he gets my sin. You know, Jesus, as he was getting ready to go to the cross in the garden, he was praying, and sweat mixed with drops of blood was coming off of his forehead. And that's very common for you ladies who've had babies, um, in labor, you sweat, I mean, you're grunting, pushing, you pop blood vessels in your eyes, you pop blood, you'll have little petechia, little red blood vessels popped in your forehead. When you're straining so hard, your capillaries break, the blood comes out and does mix with your sweat. I mean, that happens. Jesus was so burdened. He was straining so hard that sweat mixed with blood was pouring down his forehead. Why was he so upset? I don't think it was the pain. He knew it was going to be a horrible death. Pain, suffering, beating, nails in his hand, and a horrible death of suffocation. You die of heart failure. You can't breathe, and so you fill up with fluid, and you just literally drown suffocation. Horrible death. I don't think that was it. 
I think there were two other things that really, really he was struggling with. One, for the first time in eternity, and the only time in eternity, Jesus would be separated from his Father. Only time in eternity. In hell. In darkness. But I think the biggest one, even more than that, was he had put on his shoulders my sin. I mean, my sin alone would knock him to his knees. But think about this. He put your sin and your sin and all of our sin on his shoulders. And not only ours, but the whole world's. And not just this day, but for all eternity. He took all of our sin and carried it to the cross. And it knocked him to the ground. But he got up and he went to the cross so that he could give me the righteousness of God. <clears throat> As I close, my time is drawing near. I could go on for three more hours, but I don't think you would like me to do so. When I mean that I have sin, I mean, we all have sin, of course. And as we've seen baptisms, many of all or most of, if not all of you, will remember your baptisms. And you will remember that joyful day. I remember you couldn't, I say this over and over, wild horses couldn't keep me away. I know there's an old song about that. But I mean, if there are wild horses up here and I was there and I was coming up here to get baptized, I'd jump on their backs, fly over, whatever I needed to do. And I'd jump over that, throw that curtain up and get back in that water. You couldn't keep me away. I wanted Jesus so badly. And I grew in my faith and then walked many directions away from that in college. And we won't get into all that, but you were, I've shared with that with our church over some times that I was a big into partying, alcohol, all sorts of things. Yes, I studied. Yes, I did well. But I was not a witness for Jesus. And it's not just college. All through my life, I've been... Greedy, almost lost all of our children's college fund in a greedy, stupid investment. I thought I'm some great um, uh, investor. Yeah, right. I am greedy. I'm selfish. Lust after things, things of this world. And that's what I'm saying. That is why I'm saying this. I can never understand how I can have the righteousness of God given to me except through the one who had no sin, but who was on his knees sweating blood because of my sin. He gave me the righteousness of God. And don't you know, every time I wandered and he called me back, the angels in heaven were rejoicing over me over me. They were rejoicing because I was lost. But now I'm found. I was rescued by this Jesus. And that is what Easter is all about. What about you? Where are you right now? Are you walking his path? Are you like me in times of my life where mm, I think I know best, I'm going this way, Lord? Are you struggling with something, a sin? Are you struggling with temptation? Are you struggling with things in your life right now? I want you to know, just like when I was doing the same thing, that Jesus this minute is sending out an army to rescue you. He's searching for you. And the moment that Peter had when he saw that empty tomb, you have that moment right now, that empty tomb where he just now has to decide, I've got to reflect on this. I've got to marvel over this. I've got to make a decision over this. And I've got to decide, I've got to follow Jesus or reject him. And we know Peter chose faith. That time is now for all of us. 
This resurrection rescue gives us life, abundant life right now on this earth and eternal life with our, in the presence of our Creator God in His heaven, all thanks be to God. This resurrection rescue wipes away our sins and gives us the righteousness of God. God is sending out His army. He's sending out His Spirit this very minute to rescue you, to rescue me. And how will we respond? Pray with me.